We are here to look at the uh, uh, measures to improve financing for development. Um, uh, I want us all to, since we, we, some of our speakers have dropped, I also have time for uh, 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 participants also to contribute, and uh, you'll be f uh, free to contribute. You know, um, uh, ever since the Finance for Development, you know those the Rome, uh, Marrakesh and Paris uh, declarations were follow-up of the Monterey declarations. Uh, of course, uh, recently we had the Addis Ababa Action Agenda AA uh, that was in Addis, um, and of course there were other uh, res resolutions that came. Um, we had the, um, the final text for the outcome document adopted at the third international conference on financing for development. Uh, that was also in Addis, the, you know. Uh, those are some of the uh, things that came up. And of course, um, we'll be looking uh, into um, uh, into trends, issues, and challenges financing for the development, uh, civil society perspectives on its uh, on a FFD on its flow processes, and of course, uh, I'm glad um, 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 Mr. Derejas gladly agreed to work on uh, to take us through even on illicit financial uh, flows, uh, but also welcome uh, our people. Uh, opinion from the uh, participants. And of course, Kwame will be here shortly and he also take us to, to options for Africa in financing for development. Um, just a little introduction. I want to introduce um, Mr. P uh, Dr. Patrick N. Osako. He's the head of, tra the head of trade and uh, poverty branch UN conference uh, for trade and development. I, I must say before before I'd put a um, uh, proposal to ICTSD on financing for development, uh, it is Mr. Patrick uh, paper that I took, and uh, is, is a paper that he, he had done uh, some years back. I was in an intern in uh, Uneka in Addis, um, and so his paper inspired me to come with, to come up with uh, this proposal. So. Um, He's the head of trade and poverty uh, branch, UN Conference for Trade and Development. Uh, he's a PhD holder, degree in economics from Queen's University, Canada. He's country head of the trade and poverty uh, uh, branch at the United Nations, I've played that, um, and based in uh, uh, Switzerland. Um, he has also served as a chief of, chief of the finance industry and investment section at the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in Addis Ababa. Uh, before joining the United Nations, he worked as a senior analyst at the Bank of uh, Canada, Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Osaki has done extensive research in uh, international development economics and has uh, refereed publications in major economic uh, journals and books. Uh, he's won several academic awards, uh, prizes, and fellowships. He's a valedictorian, a fellow of the Cambridge Commonwealth Society, and a member of editorial board of the journal International Development Policy published by the Gra Graduate Institute. Welcome, uh, um, Dr. Patrick. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Dereje Alemeho. Alem um, actually, um, um, Stefano Pratt from uh, Society of International Development was supposed to be here. And, and I, I, uh, but unfortunately, he had other engagements. He's back in our, uh, 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 in uh, back in Europe, but he gave me the, actually I met Mr. Dereja yesterday, and uh, it was late at night when uh, he was giving me his uh, bio data. So welcome, uh, Mr. Dereja Alemayo. Uh, uh, Mr. Dereja is a MA development, uh, 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 is a PhD. He has a PhD in economics from Free University Berlin. Uh, 1987 to 1998, uh, lecturer at the Free University, Berlin <coughs> Development Studies and African Political <coughs> Economy. 1998, 2000, independent development uh, consultant. And 2000 to, pres uh, to presence working in the NGO sector as a country director in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, Tanzania, Kenya. Uh, his country as senior economic uh, justice advisor at Christian Aid. Um, um, and of course, uh, currently serving as a senior economic uh, policy advisor of Tax Justice Network Africa and chair of the Global Alliance for Tax Justice. Uh, Mr. Dereja has written two books, several articles and uh, book chapters as well as regular blog contribution development policy. 
the role of state in development, uh, uh, governance, accountability, tax, and development illicit financial flows. Um, I, I think I will inter also introduce Kwame in his absentia, but he's just coming. Uh, Mr. Kwame is the chief executive officer at the Institute of Economic Affairs, uh, public policy think tank uh, based in Nairobi, which seeks to promote plur pluralism of ideas through open, active, and informed debate on public policy. Without wasting much time, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Patrick to take us through. Thank you. Uh, you have like 20 minutes to go. Thank you. Ah, yes. Okay. Um, I would like to thank uh, AGTSD and especially uh, Eugene for inviting me to this event. I also want to thank all of you for being here. And I hope that uh, we're going to have a very uh, productive uh, discussion during this session. Now, having said that, let me begin by saying that there are four key lessons that we have learned from the experience of uh, uh, the experience with the implementation of the MDGs that I believe we should uh, bear in mind as we embark on the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals that were adopted by our heads of uh, state and government uh, uh, a few months ago. I think it's important that we bear this in mind because if we don't, I think we may run into this, the same problems that we, we had when we implemented the MDGs. And that's one of the reasons why quite a number of countries were unable to achieve the MDGs. So if we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the MDGs, we have to bear these lessons in mind. Now, the first lesson is that we have, we need the uh, broad stakeholder cons consultation. Let me just wait for this. Sorry. Okay, we need the uh, broad stakeholder consultation and inclusiveness if we want to have an effective outcome from the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. As most of you know, a lot of these goals, they were adopted by uh, governments but in, in terms of implementation, it's important that the civil society is involved. It's important that the private sector is involved. It's important that all the key stakeholders at the national level, that they are involved in the implementation of these goals. And the second lesson that I, I believe we should also bear in mind from the experience with the MDGs is that we need to address the three pillars of sustainable development in a balanced manner. I mean, we shouldn't focus on one and leave the other. We have the economic, the social, and the environmental pillar. Now, when we implemented the MDGs, there was exclusive focus on the social sectors. I mean, the social sectors are important, but you cannot have sustained improvement in, social, in the social sector without a, a, a strong and sustained economic development. And so it's important that um, when we try to implement the SDG agenda, that we do that in such a way that the economic, the social, and the environmental pillars are well addressed. Now, another lesson that I think is important in terms of uh, implementation of the SDGs is uh, the notion that uh, without peace and security, there will be no development. As most of you know, it's very difficult to find a conflict economy that has met any of the, that has met uh, uh, the MDGs. And the reason is simple. The reason is that peace and security is a necessary condition for all the good goals that we have established for ourselves. If you don't have peace and security, it doesn't matter how much, uh, what kind of policies you put in place in terms of economic and environmental policies, you will not get the desired resu result. So it's important that we take peace and security issues seriously. As you know, the greatest challenge we're facing right now in the global economy has to do with insecurity. That is what is bothering the world right now. It's not just uh, economic, it's insecurity. So if we're implementing the SDGs, we have to take security issues sec uh, uh, seriously, not treat them as secondary issues, no. They have to you know, be dealt with uh, uh, decisively. And then the final lesson that I, would, I, I think we should bear in mind is the fact that better implementation, uh, sorry, better financing and uh, implementation of commitments are important you know, in terms of uh, achieving the results we want uh, with the uh, SDGs. 
Now, what happened during the implementation of the MDGs was that we had all these goals, about eight goals, but there was no credible means of implementation. So we, we, you know, we told countries what to do, but we didn't give them the money to do it. Now, now that we are embarking on the implementation of the SDGs, it's important that you know, we try to correct this mistake that we made with the MDGs, because if we don't, we're not going to achieve what we want to achieve. Now, obviously, the SDGs, they are more ambitious you know, in terms of the goals uh, when we compare them to the, the, the MDGs. For the SDGs, we have about 17 goals. For the MDGs, we had eight. Now, this is clearly an ambitious agenda, but an ambitious agenda also requires an ambitious and credible means of implementation. And I think it's in this context that I find this session that we're having timely and important, because I think we're starting the discussion early enough, and uh, I think uh, if we put the right policies in place, we are likely to uh, get to where we want to be. Now, having said that, let me say that at uh, UNCTAD, there are two issues that we believe are important you know, in terms of whether or not we're going to achieve the SDGs. One is that the success or failure of this of the SDG agenda will depend on what happens in Africa, particularly the LDCs. And the reason is simple. Most of the poor countries are in Africa. Most of the vulnerable countries are in Africa. So if you want to achieve the SDGs, you have to start from these countries. And so Africa will play a key role you know, in terms of whether the world achieves its uh, 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 objectives with the SDG agenda. Now. The success of the SDGs will also depend, as I said earlier, on the extent to which the international community is willing and able to assist African countries in mobilizing adequate financing to implement the goals. As you know, this is a very ambitious agenda. And as I'm going to show you in one of the slides, the financing requirements are enormous. They are more than the GDP of most African countries. And so if you're expecting African countries to mobilize these resources alone, well, we just haven't started yet. We have to be realistic and recognize that you know, the financing requirements are so great that African countries cannot mobilize the resources alone. They need assistance. Okay, so let me just show you where we are in terms of uh, development finance because that will give us an idea as to what the financing gaps are. Now, if, what this table is showing is that there are four main sources of uh, development finance in Africa. We have domestic revenue, we have remittances, we have foreign direct investment, and we have official development assistance. Now, as you can see from the table, uh, all sources of development assistance in Africa has grown significantly since 2003. You can see that domestic revenue increased from uh, 174, $174 uh, uh, billion in 2003 to 555 billion in 2013. Remittances increased from 15 billion in 2003 to 60 billion in 2013. Foreign direct investment flows increased from 18 billion in 2003 to 57 billion in 2013. And ODA increased from 27 billion to 56 billion in uh, 2013. So basically there has been an increase in all the major sources of finance into Africa over the years. Now, another important point to note here is that um, domestic revenue is the most important source of financing in Africa. In fact, it's about 76% of total uh, financing in Africa. So it is the most important you know, in terms of uh, financing. However, remittances have become very important since uh, 2010. You can see since 2010, remittances became the second most important source of financing relative to uh, foreign direct investment flows and official development assistance. In fact, uh, in 2003, uh, ODA was the second most important source of financing. But as you can see, in 2013, remittances became the second most important source of financing. So there has been a change you know, in terms of the relative importance of these various uh, sources of uh, finance into Africa. Uh, no, these are all nominal. Oh, no, 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 no. 
Okay, so this is basically what I've said earlier. Uh, what I said earlier. Um, now, one last point I want to make uh, in terms of the table is that if you look at the distribution of ODA to Africa, you find out that a large part of it, sorry, what am I doing? Uh, a large part of it uh, goes to the social sectors. In fact, um, over the period 2008 to 2013, about 40% of ODA went to the social sectors. 26% went to the production sectors. Now, this is, is nobody is saying the social sectors are not important, they're important. But you also have to pay attention to the production sectors because if you don't invest in the production sectors, you're not going to have sustained growth. And you need sustained economic growth in order to ensure that you can sustainably finance social services. So we have to move away from this short-term approach, short-term way of looking at development by focusing just on the social sectors. Because in the long run, it's going to be counterproductive. Okay, so that's where we are in terms of development financing. Now, let's look at where we want to be. And by where we want to be, <coughs> I'm thinking in terms of the financing requirements for the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals adopted by our heads of uh, state and government. Now, what this table is showing is that for Africa, if you just focus on one goal alone, I'm not, I'm not looking at all the 17 goals, because if we go to the 17 goals, the, the numbers will be just too much to look at. So let's take just the first Sustainable Development Goal, which is to eradicate poverty. What are the financing requirements for Africa? And there was a recent study that was done by some colleagues at uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in Addis Ababa. And what it shows is that for Africa, if Africa is to er eradicate poverty by 2030, it has to grow at an average rate of about 16%. And to get to that average growth rate of 16%, you need an investment rate of about 87%. Now, if you consider the fact that our current, the average savings rate in Africa, over the period considered, was about 14%, and the fact that ODA and foreign direct investment flows have not been that much you know, in, relation, in relation to GDP, then you have a financing gap for Africa in terms of implementation of the first sustainable development goal of about 65% of GDP. So this means that to implement and achieve the first sustainable development goal in Africa, you need, a, you need um, an investment of about uh, $3 trillion a year. This is a lot of money, just for one goal. Now, of course, the requirements vary across the various sub-regions, depending on their savings rate, depending on the distribution of income, because in most of these estimates, the assumption is that the distribution of income is going to be constant over the 15-year period of the implementation of the SDGs. Now, to the extent that income distribution is not constant, the, the uh, required investment ratio will be much higher. So basically, what this table is showing us is that Africa requires a lot of money, way more than it can mobilize by itself, in order to implement even just one of the sustainable development goals. So it's not something that Africa can do alone. Africa needs a lot of assistance in order to be able to implement the SDGs. That's the message that I'm, I want you to get from this uh, table. Now, if you look at the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, which deals with uh, financing for development, you will find out that, you know, I mean, they do talk about, it does talk about the importance of, you know, all forms of development finance, but it focuses on two. One is increasing domestic public resources, and the second is private finance. Now, these are all important sources of financing, but they are going to present significant challenges for Africa because if you look at the scale of the financing requirements, as I showed, as I, as I uh, indicated earlier, just for the first SDG, Africa needs about 65% of its GDP to be able to implement the first SDG. Now, if you recognize the fact that the, the domestic resources, for example, in 2013 was about, 500 and, uh, uh, 50, was about $555 billion. But the requirements for the SDGs to implement the SDG number one, which is the eradication of poverty, is about $3 trillion. That means there's a huge financing gap 
And it's not something we can do by just mobilizing domestic resources alone. Domestic resources can help us, but it's not, it's not going to be enough you know, in terms of uh, uh, meeting the investment requirements for implementing the SDGs. So I have, a, I, have a, I have an issue with you know, the focus so much on domestic resources, because I don't think it's realistic, given where, where we are now in terms of mobilization of domestic resources. The second challenge that I think we have you know, in terms of the proposed uh, sources of financing is that there is so much emphasis on private finance. Now, private finance is important, things like FDI, remittances, um, and other types of uh, private flows. But what we do know that is that Africa has always had difficulties mobilizing private finance, especially external private finance. So except there is an incentive structure, except we come up with some policies and incentives to sort of make the private sector feel that there is something in this for them, we're not going to get the kind of private investment that we're looking for. Now, this is important because when you think of the SDGs, you realize that I mean, these goals were set by governments. They were not set by the private sector. So it's unrealistic for the public sector to expect the private sector to willingly invest in the implementation of the SDGs without some sort of incentive structure. Now, in the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, there, there is some discussion of you know, how to get the private sector to uh, invest in the SDGs. But I don't find any of the suggestions you know, credible. I think we need to do more in terms of coming up with concrete ideas on how to get the private sector to move in, in terms of investing in the areas that we want the private sector to invest. So now that takes me to my last, uh, the last part of my presentation, which is what, what should we do in terms of mobilizing resources? Now I did say that domestic resources are important, but they cannot be the main source of financing. Having said that, you know, there are various ways we can strengthen domestic resource mobilization. Uh, to help us uh, 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 reduce uh, some of the financing constraints we face in uh, the development process. One, as most of you know, is the issue of uh, tax administration. We have to have better tax administration. We have to make more efficient use of public resources because it's not just increasing domestic revenue that is important. It is making better use of what you already have because there's a lot of you know, leakages, lots of wastages in terms of use of public resources. So we have to make better use of public resources if we want domestic resource mobilization to play a more positive role in the development process. We also have to strengthen domestic financial infrastructure and systems. In fact, there was a, there was a study that was done uh, about five years ago where African policymakers were asked what the major constraint to domestic <coughs> resource mobilization was in their countries. And two factors came out clearly. One was uh, the issue of uh, weak banking infrastructure. And the second was uh, weak governance. So if we want to deal with issues of domestic resource mobilization, we have to address these two uh, uh, areas where we're facing challenges. We also need better economic governance and management. And uh, we also have to find ways to stem illicit financial flows. Uh, one of the st uh, studies that was done uh, recently, uh, based on the um, work of uh, the former South African uh, president, Mr. Thabo Mbeki, he headed uh, a panel on illicit financial flows uh, recently. And uh, one of the conclusions of that study was that Africa was losing about uh, $50 billion per year in terms of illicit financial flows. And then, I mean, this is money. This is almost to the same size as the volume of ODA that comes to Africa. So obviously, uh, if we can get this money back to Africa and use it more productively, it will help you know, in terms of implementation of the SDGs. Now, another thing we have to do is to increase the level of ODA and allocate it in a more strategic way. What do I mean by allocating it in a more strategic way? Paying, I mean paying more attention to investments in the production sectors such as agriculture, such as industry, such as infrastructure. Those are areas where uh, 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 we can um, um, make investments that would uh, give us the, 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 growth, the, the high growth rate that we need to um, succeed you know, in terms of achieving the, the, the objectives that we set in the, 
the SDG agenda. We also have to strengthen or make better use of ODA in terms of uh, strengthening capacity to mobilize domestic resources. Because so far, the role of ODA is just to fill the financing gap. But we think that ODA should be used more strategically. For example, it should be used to leverage more domestic resources. For example, helping African governments to improve capacity to mobilize uh, resources. I think that's one way in which ODA could play a more positive role in the implementation of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. We also have to try to catalyze more private finance. Now, I said that we should not rely only on private finance. But to the extent that governments can find a way to incentivize the private sector to invest in the SDG sectors, that will be something positive. And there are various ways that governments can do that, like, for example, providing investment guarantees. For example, in the area of infrastructure, it's very difficult for the private sector to invest in infrastructure without some sort of guarantees by the government, because this is an area where the, 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 the initial cost, the sunk costs are so high relative to the benefits you get in the short run. The benefits come in the long run. But all, a lot of the costs will have to be made today. Right? So if the government wants the private sector to invest in those sectors, uh, they have to find a way of providing incentives. And investment guarantees will play a key role in that area. We also have to promote corporate social responsibility because I mean, when we think about the private investment, it's not just the money itself, it's also the behavior of the private sector. If you take, for example, oil producing and exporting countries, we find out that a lot of the damage that is being done you know, in terms of sustainable development comes from the investments and activities of uh, multinational corporations. So it's not just the fact that they're bringing money that we're asking, uh, that, that is important. It's also the, 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 their behavior. If they're bringing in money, but at the same time they're polluting the environment and making it difficult, for example, for farmers to grow uh, uh, crops, then they're not playing a positive role in the development process. So they have to be, there has to be a way of getting the private sector to be a bit more responsible in terms of the way they act on the continent. Um, we also have to create a better environment for investment in terms of you know, having good macroeconomic policies that foster macroeconomic stability. And lastly, we have to harness the potential of trade for growth and income generation, because this is one aspect that I think we have not really tried to exploit uh, uh, very well. Um, trade, I think, it's one of the ways of generating enormous resources to finance the SDGs in Africa. Unfortunately, African countries lack capacity. Uh, they don't have very good market access in some of the key areas important to them and their production and export structures are not well diversified. So if we can provide better market access for African countries, uh, expand their export capacity through some sort of you know, aid for trade, for example, and assist them in diversifying their production and export structures, I think uh, they can uh, mobilize uh, 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 quite significant resources you know, for implementing the SDGs. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Uh, I don't think I'll add much. I'll just give uh, uh, space to Mr. Dereja. Thank you very much. Um, very difficult to, to start from where my predecessor stopped. In the first place, we agreed that I come to stand in for uh, Stefano only yesterday. In the second place, I'm not a systematic person, so I will not have any such beautiful presentation. Um, and the other thing is, I'm not going to speak here as an expert, but as a tax justice activist, just to, be, to make it clear. So no tables, no, but some figures. Um, I will start with uh, our reaction to the FFD. Uh, FFD process and FFD conference uh, last July in Addis. After the meeting, we met to discuss, and what we agreed was we achieved a huge defeat. I'm paraphrasing uh, the former German Chancellor who, who said, There is no denial, we achieved defeat. So, anyway, uh, why, why is it just look? Uh, Dr. Patrick mentioned the action agenda. Go through it and find a single actionable deliverable. 
compare it with what happened in Paris this week. We know what is available for climate adaptation. Go to the Addis Action Agenda, you will not find anything. So, uh, and the other thing is the atmosphere in which the discussion was conducted. Actually, there was, the delegates didn't get together to discuss the issues. The rich country said, we are not going to negotiate on this text. There were two things they wanted to get eliminated principally. <coughs> One was the, the, I will come back to it, the issue of a UN-based multilateral uh, process through which international tax rules could be reformed. They just said, take it out. If there is UN-based thing in it, we will not discuss. The other one was to also use in finance the concept of common but differentiated responsibilities. And th this is, you know, it is, it is a reflection of the, the relation of power in financial terms in the global economy as well. Without having this principle in it, there is no uh, equitable solution to the problems with this. So they just said, and then the host country, there was a group of G77, and then there were the OECD countries, especially the US and UK, who just blocked, we will not discuss. So just to save the, the situation from collapse, there was a foul compromise made. That is why it, there, is, there is nothing actionable in it. Okay. Uh, <coughs> there are, I can, I can comment on each of the, the sub-chapters, but it might take too long. Uh, domestic resource mobilization. Uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Patrick uh, that it has already, it accounts already for the, the most part of resources African countries, developing countries are mobilizing. But there is still a lot to be done in this area as well. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing is there are lots of loopholes in, in our tax laws which could be improved and which should be improved. Um, I read the, in the Daily Monitor in Kampala, uh, the IMF uh, President Rep uh, wrote a very interesting uh, op-ed uh, in, in the Daily uh, Newspaper of, uh, Daily Monitor, I think. And it says, the link between potholes and loopholes, which is actually uh, uh, a very fundamental, if, if you have traveled in Uganda, you know what potholes mean there. So there are all these things to be done. Uh, <coughs> however, uh, when we say domestic resource mobilization, it is about also defending the tax rights of a nation for making multinationals pay taxes where they do business, where they do their profit. In that sense, the whole international discussion was, the process was, to make, you know, the, the current prevailing international tax rules were done in, uh, by the League of Nations when uh, almost all African countries never existed. So these rules cannot function anymore. And, and these rules, of course, rules are always for the makers and those who made the rules are the, 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 the economic powers of today. So the whole thing was to suggest that a new system replaces the, the existing tax rules and that developing countries also be part of, should be part of the process of solution seeking and part of the implementation. So that is why civil society and southern governments as well were asking for a UN tax body which will facilitate such uh, multilateral process to come up with a, a, really, a, a, a truly uh, equitable uh, solution to this problem. Rich countries said no, and they said <coughs> there is uh, an OECD process which is uh, about base erosion and profit shifting. There is a system, uh, and the BEPS process is coming up with solutions, and now what, what has come out of this is the rules will be made by rich countries and then the capacity building of poor countries will be built to implement the rules that rich countries have done. 
and our slogan uh, we repeated in the UN system was, if you are not at the table, you are on the menu. So that is really what happened as well. Uh, so now the, the, the action agenda on, on tax is, it's not about developing countries defending their taxing rights. I'll come to the uh, <coughs> tax dodging aspect of multinationals. Uh, what happened was then, there is, it's, it is reduced to, it is not about fighting for taxing rights of a country or a nation state. It became about capacity building. In other words, really, you are ignorant to take care of your national interests, we will train you to do that. That is a message out of it. So it was a big defeat that there was no possibility of even mentioning a process which leads to the creation of a UN tax body. Private sector finance, there was a lot talked about it. Uh, there, there are two things here. Private sec when we say private sector, we confuse a lot of structures in it. But the world economy is dominated by corporations, by big business. So we have to make a distinction between big business and private sector per se. And in this case, now for me, making the private sector responsible for development finance is, uh, there is a German proverb which says, to make a goat a gardener. So it is, a, it is making a goat a gardener and expecting a flourishing garden. So that, that is what is happening. And I can't go into the details. The whole thing of TPP, there are some countries which have, uh, which have uh, abolished PPP, the, the pre private part, public-private partnership. They have made a law to, up, to, to reject it because it, it, it turns out that it is about privatization of gains and socialization of costs. You know, what's happening is this. If you look at rich countries, the interest rate is almost below zero. But there is no investment go, going away. You, you decrease interest rate to encourage investment. But there is no investment, go, you know, there is no investment at the rate which they are required. Because, why? Because investors are not happy with the returns they, they expect from rich countries. So there is a huge idle capital sitting everywhere. So it needs an outlet, it needs an investment. So now what's happening in the form of PPP is you will guarantee 25% in, in some cases. 25% return, whatever the outcome of the, the investment might be. That is why I'm always worried about this guaranteed investment. So <coughs> now it is always like this. When there is superfluous uh, idle capital, poor countries are encouraged to borrow first at a very minimal interest rate, and then after some time, they will hike the interest rate because it is a flexible one, and then you will pay more than you have, you have, you have borrowed. So there are all, already such things. Uh, International Development Cooperation, ODI, ODA, it was also mentioned. There are only a few countries which have re reached the 0 0.7 commitment than 40 years ago, but a few countries have. There is no concrete commitment about countries, rich countries pledging to reach even the 0 0.7 percent threshold. International trade, a, a very worrying development, if you look at how investment, state investor disputes are going to be settled, it is not even in normal courts. You know, uh, the clauses now in the investment treaties, for example, asking for technology transfer as a performance criteria for investment, applying country rules of labor safety and everything can be sued as infringing upon the interest of investors. The very simple thing like demanding local content for investors when they, when they have to buy their inputs, asking them to buy the inputs in country if it is available is suable. 
in, in, a, in a private court. So what has, what has FFT done to, to resolve this? Nothing. Dead. <coughs> Another issue. We have been told we were extravagant with the money we borrowed, we wasted it. But for every irresponsible borrowing, there is irresponsible lending. It cannot happen. The first is then, what has happened then to, to also make irresponsible lending an, uh, a crime, um, uh, <coughs> an offense, just like irresponsible lending? That is one thing. The other one is, in uh, if you take the private sector, capitalism cannot exist. If you were to confuse liquidity crisis with insolvency crisis, the myth that countries cannot go bankrupt is sustained only because it is to make poor countries pay while under whichever circumstances they, are, they might have borrowed the money. You know, there was when we were campaigning against the debt, uh, there, was, <coughs> there was this um, anecdote we were telling. If I owe you $1,000, I will spend sleepless night. But if I owe you $10 billion, you will be the one. <laughs> <laughs> spending sleepless nights. So the whole debt servicing structure is created to, to make sure that the ones who have lent also get there under which, whichever circumstances. No mention of debt restructuring, no mention of looking at sovereign debt restructuring and also making payments, not payments dependent on the economic performance of a country. If I go bankrupt, I'll be left with, as, 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 as a businessman, I'll be left with the essentials to sustain my living. And they only pay what, what, what then at least is available after I've insured. But when African countries were forced to service their debt in whichever way they incurred it, it was not asked, aha, if they, if they service their, their debt from their resources by 60%, there is no money for schools. There is no money for, there was no such consideration. So repayment was not aligned to the economic performance. All these things should have been renegotiated. And you know also the, the, the attempt at the UN uh, to, to bring in the sovereign debt restructuring issue, which was the, the most influential countries voted against it. So, okay, technology transfer, uh, that is also, as I said, in the investment section, it was something that is also not adequately treated. Systemic issues, again, uh, like uh, MDG uh, aid, only empty promises, no structure, no downward accountability. You know, accountability functions only if it is reciprocal. Uh, for example, if African countries or developing countries are accountable for <coughs> the economic policies they do, what about rich countries? For example, there is an issue the IMF itself raised recently. Are not rich countries obliged to, to look at the spillover effect of their policies on developing countries? For example, if the US, the US were to decide to, to raise interest rates, is it not worth considering what impact this would have on developing countries whose debts are denominated in dollars. No room, no discussion about these issues. Reforming the international, uh, <coughs> the IFI, to give, to give more rights to, to developing countries equivalent to, <coughs> even if it is not like the UN system where one country, one vote prevails, there could be a, a structure where the, the weight of developing and emerging economies can be increased in the international financial architecture, nothing. Nothing about uh, democratization of the global economic governance. Follow up, okay, I will leave it there. Uh, I have five minutes. Okay, uh, that, so you take any heading, heading under which the FFD process discussed and the outcome is nothing tangible, it has not addressed the key issues, I'll leave it at that. Quickly to the <coughs> illicit financial flows. Uh, when we started about illicit financial campaigning about illicit financial flows five 
five, six years ago, it was very difficult to fight against two perceptions. The first was even Africans, live alone the rich countries, uh, citizens, believe Africa lives on the life support it gets from the North. And then we came up with a figure saying, uh, we ask, you know, when we do started workshops on, on this topic, we'll ask, do you think Africa gets more money from the North than it loses? And everybody would say, of course we get more money. And then, and then what, <coughs> What is the reality? The reality is that is an OECD admission. It's not our figures. For every three do <coughs> one dollar coming to developing countries in the form of AIDS, three dollars leave developing countries in the form of illicit financial flows. So, simple arithmetic. Plus one, minus three. <laughs> so. That is how we are supposed to finance our development. The second question is, ask <coughs> also our Africa, uh, everybody, okay, if we even admit how much of our resources, what percentage of the resources leaving the continent are stolen by African rulers or by corrupt African politicians? Everybody would say 99%. Be because, you know, there is, <laughs> There is an Amharic proverb which says, for a mouse, there is no big animal than a cat. <laughs> so we have been indoctrinated to, to look at our pickpockets and we never see the rovers. Again, the, the, the figure uh, my, my brother mentioned earlier, the, 60, the 50 to 60 billion uh, illicit financial flows from Africa, according to this study, 60% of these resources are flow out of the continent through commercial transactions. African looters, illicit trade, and everything cover about 40% of the whole thing. So I could, I could go into detail. The method, the method is very easy. The method used by multinational corporations to cheat on tax, it is very easy. Just have in, in, your, in your head profit is a one tax which will be taxed. Profit is equal to cost minus sales. What do I need to do to lower my P, the profit? In countries where I have to pay taxes, I will increase my costs. In countries where I don't need to pay taxes, I will increase my sales. So what have, through such a construction, multinational companies have restructured themselves such that they have huge costs. You will think, in, if you look at some of the revenue st finance statement of multinational companies, you will think that they are philanthropic because they work in Africa without any profit. <laughs> An ActionAid study in Ghana found out Saab Miller, the second big uh, browser in the, in the world, paid less taxes than a kiosk beer vendor in Ghana, in Accra. So how does it happen? I can tell you the, stru the structures. Just look at this. Uh, the Isle of Jersey, a small island between England and France, is the biggest banana exporter to Western Europe. And it does not grow a single banana. The British Virgin Islands, one of the <coughs> overseas ter territories of the UK, they have 36 investors registered in their country per inhabitant. So there are 36 times more investors registered in the British Virgin Islands than inhabitants in, the, in these islands. Take Cayman Islands, one of the overseas territories. Obama said, unfortunately, at that time he was a senator, not a president, he said, there is an office building in Cayman Islands which houses 12,000 American companies. It is either the biggest building in, in, in the world or the biggest scam. So why, why do they go to Google, I have no time, go to Google and see where multinational companies have registered their brands. What happens is like this. Sub Miller, for example, is the example I gave you. <coughs> 
The bill they are selling in Accra is called Star. It does not have a name called Sub Miller. But when they were declaring their expenses, they said they pay a patent fee of how many million dollars a, a year for Sub Miller International Beer Holding Company registered in Rotterdam. So payment for, for brand use is an expense. So it is deductible from tax liability. So I have to finish it. At any rate, there are two things very important to note. We are talking about a, a trade conference. 60% of international trade is between affiliated companies. 60, that is an OECD figure. So all the mischief, trade misinvoicing. If you have, if you have time, you can look at what Kenya sub, sub, allegedly imported from the US, it will be registered as an export in the US and as an import here. But Kenya exports to the US will be re registered as import in the US and export in Kenya. By comparing the two figures alone, we found out as Christian that 160 billion US dollars are cheated out of revenue authorities in developing countries through misinvoicing alone. Mispricing is still worse. Mispricing is when affiliated companies trade with one another and make a game such that costs are inflated in countries where they make economic benefit and profits are happening in countries where they don't even have economic activity. Uh, <coughs> according to profitability criteria, Bermuda is the most profitable uh, state in the world, about 47 times higher profits than anywhere else in the world, because you only need a post office box. You don't need any em uh, employee. Uh, Eva Jolie, in one of her studies uh, on, on illicit financial flows and, and uh, profit shifting, found out in one island 1,500 companies were managed by nine people. <coughs> so these are all the mechanisms which are there facilitating illicit financial flows. Instead of arresting this, we are told you need capacity. Capacity to, to catch thieves, or it is better to catch the thieves instead of training us how to, how to understand their trick. So capacity building is necessary, but capacity building is not the main issue. The issue is structure. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Mr. Derejer, and thank you, uh, Dr. Patrick. We have heard from both ends. Um, I want to open the floor. Um, um, Mr. Kwame is not here at the moment, but I think we'll just still uh, proceed. So if you have uh, comments or, or reaction from, uh, from the floor, I'd like to see your hands in. Okay, there's one person there. Okay. Um, then you good. You could go. Okay. My name's Crystal. I'm from the Tax Justice Network Africa. Um, so this is for Professor Patrick Osakwe, and I'm wondering how to balance invest incentivizing investments with what Dereja just spoke about. Um, yeah, what th that con convulgence of the two areas and how that will work for us. Um, and secondly, I didn't hear anything about data, and there's a thought around the, the, the data revolution and recognizing the data is central to development, not just for monitoring, but for um, planning purposes. And I just wanted to hear your thoughts on, on that thought. Thank you. <coughs> oh, okay, thank you, the presenters. Um, Wor Ponga from the African Policy Center. Uh, I have, I think, two questions. Or two. Uh, the first one is slightly related to what she just said, where Dr. Patrick talked about the need for incentive structure for the private sector to invest in the SDGs. And I was just asking what could be some of the incentives that uh, the different governments could adopt. Yes, and then uh, the second question goes to this issue of uh, capacity for resource mobilization which uh, the Red just talked about and uh, Dr. Patrick had mentioned earlier. I wanted to find out, uh, has there been studies on, uh, for example, uh, the cost 
of investing in capacity for resource mobilization. Because in some cases, somebody would say, instead of using this money for building the capacity of the people, why not just use that money to uh, give the people for the implementation of the programs? And lastly, uh, I was looking at your table on the financing gap, Dr. Patrick, yeah? And I noticed something. I don't know, maybe you can take us to the, that slide on the financing gap in Africa. <coughs> yes, and in that table, I looked at Northern Africa and I saw the financing gap at negative 3.7. And I noticed that this could be a surplus instead of a gap. And I'm asking, this is just for Africa alone. We have Northern Africa already having a surplus. If we were to take the picture of the whole world, then there's obviously so many countries with surpluses. Can we have some structure so that these surpluses can be used to finance the countries with uh, the financing gaps? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Judy Uma. I facilitate at the Kenya School of Monetary Studies. I have a question for <coughs> Dr. Patrick. You really did mention about uh, one of the key failures being that uh, there was nothing much on the broad stakeholder consultation. Now, my point, my question is actually to what level? Because we live in a, in a country, as he said, where the politicians are what they are. And this is a country where we were once told that there is no relationship between rain and trees. And it was said in a year like this one where there was a lot of rain. So <laughs> the people actually believed it. So to what level really do we really engage in terms of stakeholders? And how do we handle these people who as he mentioned, are our politicians, because at the end of the day, they're the people who are actually believed, so that we have a really uh, key um, development in that particular area. Um, my other issue is also in terms of financing. We do get some amount of finance, but my problem is how we channel the finance. Uh, we have uh, areas where, in one year, we are having, in terms of production sector, we're teaching our farmers how to grow cotton. The next area we go to the same same farmers again with a lot of money in terms of financing on how to grow legumes. Again, in the same same area we go again next year with a different kind of crop. So the issue is not really we are not even getting the money for for, for helping them in this sector. But how are we channeling and what is the impact? Is it really sustainable in the long run? Because this group now eventually have become experts in in capacity building and being trained on how to grow different things. And my question for the region, what is the way out? <laughs> because we seem to be having a lot of problems, really. How do we get out of this quagmire? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Joy Kiru from the University of Nairobi. My question goes to Alemayo. Really, I think you've opened my eyes. Many times we've been talking about uh, private, um, public-private partnerships and the FDIs, and you've talked about the, pl the, the, pl the plus one minus two equations and all that, and the, the socialization of costs while privatizing the gains. Now, if you look at that situation, sometimes you want to think that those are very bad things, the private private, public-private <laughs> partnerships. You want to think that they, they end up in net gains and should not be encouraged. In fact, you gave an example about a country that has rejected them because of those uh, loopholes.